this is the most thorough video you're going to find on Norwood Hitchhike. This is the first explanation video to notice all of the pieces and to link them together in a way that actually makes sense. By the end of this video, you shouldn't think that any part of the game where you're like, that was odd or that didn't make any sense. I believe that everything happened for a reason. At the end, I will reveal just how many people were involved. It'll surprise you. Holly, who is 19, is driving home from a convention. She decides that traffic is so terrible that the only logical solution is to reroute 12 hours to the backwoods. She was also passed by a white van that many key observers did note right away. Driving in the middle of the night, Holly starts to run out of gas. On my second playthrough, I noticed something no one else seemed to have picked up on. While Holly is looking for a gas station, I briefly spot someone in white walking in the forest. This sets the stage for my theory, but I'll get to that in a bit. Holly stops at the gas station to refuel. At the gas station, the other customer acts strange. He will barely interact with her at first. As we check out, the cashier tells us a legend of people going missing. In the Fierce of Fathom games, the developer Ray L.L. does an excellent job at setting up people and scenarios that are really creepy at first, but they turn out to be simple, harmless red herring. And I think what makes these games so good is we're creeped out at the innocent moments. By the time actual real danger happens, we have our guard down. The other commenters I saw who were dissecting this game definitely seem to agree that this moment is a harmless interaction. However, I fully believe that he is the first major piece of this puzzle. As the cashier tells us the story, unbeknownst to us, there is a man outside who is actually messing with our car. It is actually the man who passed us in the van a little bit earlier. Right when we were about to walk outside and catch him in the act, the cashier stops us with a one more thing. He tells us that if there is a woman on the side of the road or any hitchhikers, do not stop. This is important for two reasons, one of which I'll mention soon, but the most important thing in this moment is he prevents us from seeing the man messing with our car. If we leave quickly, we see him walking away from the car towards his white van. If the cashier did not stop us, we could have caught him in the act and been too afraid to carry on our way or called the police. We could have missed him completely depending on where we parked because of the cashier's actions. I don't think that this is a coincidence. It's worth noting that the van drives in the direction that we are headed. After we talk to the cashier, we're able to interact with the other customer a little bit more. Whenever we ask him something, anytime we bother him, he just says, big mistake. At first this is confusing, it makes zero sense, but I think it'll make sense in hindsight. More on that later. Somehow, not bothered by any of that, Holly is on her way. As we're driving, the lights start to flicker on and off, indicating mechanical issues are happening. Somehow the lights flickering on her car weren't even worth a comment from narrator Holly. As we're driving, we run into a car. In no other video or article I read was this mentioned nor thought of as significant, but this is a huge moment for many reasons. I want you to look at this car and keep it in the back of your mind as the story progresses. Put a pin in it for now. But in this moment, I believe that the car is slowing us down. It's slowing us down on purpose. For a little bit, he's driving really slow and no matter how hard we try, we cannot pass him. Then he races off never to be seen again. I believe that the guy in the van is preparing the logs on the road and this car is checking on us to make sure that the car is malfunctioning and making sure that we don't blow past their trap before it's ready. As we are driving along, we see many abandoned cars in a place where that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Finally, we arrive at the logs in the road. There are fresh, unbroken tire tracks, so this was placed very recently, I believe by the van in the car that passed us. I also found road close signs at the hotel we're about to be taken to. I think it's another way of trapping people. Why would a hotel need those? We meet the log trap and stop. Holly gets out and moves the logs, but when she goes to start the car, it doesn't turn over. Now she is stranded. As time and cars pass, Holly remarks that people are pure evil for not stopping. This is why I think that the cashier is a little bit more sinister than I first thought. I believe that he tells everyone who stops the same story. Under no circumstances should you stop for a hitchhiker. I believe that he's trying to help out the other guys, which I will now refer to as a cult. Perhaps he doesn't know who the victims will be, so he tells every single person to have his bases covered. Now, no one will stop for Holly, except for those involved, and of course, not scared to do so because they know the story's made up. I do not think it's a coincidence that the only person who stops is the customer from the shop, Jason, who was just wandering around the store, not looking at anything in particular. I think he felt really guilty about what was going on or he didn't want to give himself away, which is why he wouldn't talk. I also believe he was just wasting time until it was his turn to participate in the plan. It is so hard to hear even with studio quality headphones, but when he arrives and a little bit into our drive, it sounds like people are talking and clapping, a very unusual radio station to be listening to. It sounds a little cultish to me.
As Jason talks more, he hints that he knows our car was deliberately tampered with and tells us, if you don't bother them, you don't be bothered. I think in the store when we tried to talk to him, we were bothering them by asking questions. I think that's why he only answered, big mistake. Jason reveals that the cashier does in fact tell that story about not stopping for hitchhikers to everyone who goes in the store. This reinforces my theory that the only person intended to pick us up was Jason, and now he's free to take us where the other men or cult members are that can do us harm. We can clearly see upon entering that this hotel is condemned, a little place that is not meant to be open and therefore would not be checked by inspectors or found by regular people. Obviously no one's staying unless they are stranded or they're brought there. And now we meet the clerk, Joe. In my gameplay, I joke that Joe looks like the brother of the gas station cashier. They look similar and they're dressed similarly. I don't think it's a far cry if they're working together that they could be related. Joe tells us about the roadside assistance that they offer. I find it really interesting that no one who dissected this game was at all bothered that a condemned hotel has roadside assistance. It seems obvious to me that this is to retrieve the cars easily and to keep people from looking for us if they found the abandoned car as we'd just be handing over the keys. Trust me, I searched this whole property in my gameplay. I even found the edge of the map and fell off. Mom, I fell off the, the map. Don't be mad. Send help. The only things around are creepy structures, a weird trailer, and a white van from before. There is nowhere to work on a car here. As we wander around, we hear some weird cult-like propaganda chatter from room 4. This gave me the same vibes as what Jason was listening to at first. I really thought it was actually the same the first time I played, but Jason sounds more like clapping and many people speaking. This sounds more like a leader speaking truths. Let's talk about the car outside of room 4. In my work, I know that any added detail is a discussion, a process, it's a lot of work, especially when you have to code all the O's and ones to get something like a bumper sticker on a car. I wondered for a while, why would it be on there? It had to be deliberate. My first guess was that Mobile is usually the gas station in Fierce to Fathom games, which would tie him to the gas station cashier. But then I realized this is the car that deliberately blocked and slowed down Holly. I think the bumper sticker was Ray L's way of giving us a little clue to work with if we are keen. So now we're here at this hotel. As we enter our room, we're scared by Tommy, who just acts a little bit strange at everything we say, laughing inappropriately at everything. Tommy is insistent that we leave. When we come back, he has somehow talked to Joe at the front desk, despite telling us that her phone doesn't work. And I may add that there's no cell phone service in this room. Interesting. After we bring everything in, we are relaxing in bed when someone stops and waves at our window. If you get up fast enough, you can actually see it's the man from room 4. This next moment is perhaps the most problematic for most fans of the game, who think it's stupid and unrealistic. No one knows why this elaborately strange event happened, but I actually think that there's an answer. Although, I do agree it's elaborate. I'm talking about the moment when Holly decides she can't sleep. She leaves her room, somehow brave enough, after a strange man just waved in her window. She crosses the parking lot and gets a coffee from the machine beside room 4. This is a strange move because it wasn't ever a guarantee that Holly would want coffee or feel comfortable enough to leave her room. Why drug coffee in a huge vending machine that has to be rolled out and plugged in across the parking lot rather than, say, leave a complimentary coffee machine in the room? I think I have the reason which I'll say in a moment. But first, we must discuss the next part that also confuses and anger people. Once we finally make it back to our room after being drugged immediately after drinking the coffee, we lay down and fall asleep. As we start to wake up, our phone rings. We hear someone scramble off into the closet. Then it takes quite some time for Joe to show up at our door. The only discussion about this moment I've seen over and over is that someone was doing us harm while we slept, and then Joe came to address complaints of goofy sounds. Everyone thinks that Holly was abused in her sleep, but I think they were actually preparing to kidnap her. I think that the goofy sounds were made up, and they were actually preparing to kidnap her and she woke up. As you can see by the scarce parking lot, I don't think there are other guests that would complain about goofy noises. I am certain that Joe saw us wake up. His monitor is off when we arrive and he doesn't have a book or anything. He's just standing there staring at nothing. I think he watches the cameras that are placed and didn't want us to see it on the monitor, so he turned it off. If he is watching, he would have saw Holly waking up and called on the phone that doesn't work to warn the guy who's preparing to take us that we were about to catch him, which would complicate things. Joe coming to the room was simply to get us out so that the man could escape. That is the only time the phone works while we are there. 
This is the moment I struggled with for a while because it doesn't make any sense why Joe would interrupt and ask us to walk all the way to the machine and then tell us to take medicine and hide in our room. It truly makes no sense at all. For one thing, they'd have a hard time getting the dude out of the room stylistically and you'd miss out on a major trip through the parking lot. All the controls are backward. You have to admit that it was pretty cool when all the controls switched. I won't fault him for that choice. It really did add a lot to the game, but I'm curious how the true story read for these moments. It couldn't have been that. Obviously, some creative choices were made to enhance gameplay. But once we get to the coffee machine spot, how many of you noticed that the trunk was open? Everyone thinks that Joe is our hero, but I truly believe he was going to shove us in this trunk. The only way we'd willingly walk to that spot while we're compromised is to prove something to someone we see as an ally. I believe that our stuff was suddenly organized because they're probably going to take it and us to wherever they take people. So why the change of heart? Why did he give us medicine instead of shoving us into that trunk? The only reasoning I can think of is how we were talking and acting. Maybe he thought that we were a minor. People who are 19 can easily look a little bit younger. Or maybe he just felt bad for us and decided to let us go and he would deal with the other guys later. Or maybe this is just what they do. Maybe they just play with some people. Obviously, they had the antidote. The clerk clearly knew about the drugging and the antidote drugs in the drawer and advised Holly about them, but offered no deeper explanation. Nor did Holly ask a damn thing about it. So this happens a lot, or they at least have the means to call an audible. So we get back to our room, someone takes our picture. I don't know why nobody's talking about this, but it is pretty significant. We start hearing culty sounding whispers. Listen. And then to me, during my gameplay, it sounded like three different people. We start hearing a lot of hello. That means that multiple people could be waiting at our door, but only one appears to break in. I truly think at this point they are just having fun with her. Joe comes in after and hits the man. I truly think he pretends to hit him and insists that he doesn't want to involve the police as it would affect the hotel's reputation. Folks, let's think about that for a second. The motel is unfit for occupancy. It has no reputation. He just didn't want to throw heat on something that they do over and over again. It's just a false sense of the situation being over now that the guy is allegedly hurt. Let's be honest, Joe just swaggers on in casually and goes right to where the guy is without checking or being scared. It seems rehearsed. Let's finally see everybody who's involved for the very first time. The person or people in white water around in the forest may be warning the other guy that the car is on its way. This could also be the red car with the bumper sticker as it comes from that direction later. The white van to tail them, compromise them, and trap them. The cashier at the gas station to make sure no one stops for anyone. Jason to pick them up. Room 4 to drug us and stock us, and it seems to be the same man as the white van. The red bumper sticker car to slow us down and to take us. Joe to secure the room and to watch over the whole thing and Tommy to get the cars. I think that the whole town is working together to either kidnap people or do harm, or at the very least mess with people for fun, all with a very culty overtone of sounds and whispers from their cars and rooms. Jason warns us ominously before dropping us off that there's all kinds of people. I truly think it takes all kinds of people for an operation to run that smooth. Show this with anyone who you think would love to discuss this with us, anyone who is confused by this game or angered by it or loves it, hates it, share with anybody and leave your thoughts and theories below. This is my first explanation video, but if you're interested in the Fears of Fathom series gameplay that I have, feel free to check that out on my channel. And if you love indie horror games, subscribe and follow for more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.